Hi, everyone. This is Luciera, and you're now listening to Life After the Crown with Tim Tialdo. Hey, everybody. My name is Tim Tialdo, and welcome to Season 2 of the Life After the Crown podcast. It's hard to believe we already have a year of episodes under our belt. And if you haven't had a chance to hear any of those, I do encourage you to go back and listen to them. There are many valuable interviews that you will definitely gain some wisdom from. Now, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, Each episode of Life After the Crown, I interview former pageant contestants and title holders and women of influence who share advice and stories on how to help you succeed in the world of pageants, but more importantly, how you can flourish in the professional world once your pageant journey comes to an end. As always, I appreciate you taking the time to download this podcast. I do value your time, and I'm glad you're here listening. So let's get started. My guest today is one of the top runway and pageant coaches in the entire world. As well as being the runway expert for the Miss Universe organization, she is the private coach and guide for preteens, teens, and Mrs. Competitions. This year's winner for Miss Teen USA, I had the chance to crown her myself, Kaylee Garris, was trained by Lou, as was past winners such as Miss USA's 2017 and 2016, Kara McCullough and Deshauna Barber, Deshauna's runner-up, who was Miss Hawaii USA 2016, Chelsea Harden, and Miss USA and Miss Universe 2012, of course, the wonderful Olivia Culpo. This year, Lou was named Best Coach by the Global Beauty Awards organization for her accomplishments in the field. Known simply as Lou in the industry, she turned her supermodel expertise into an empowerment business teaching modeling, runway presence, and pageant confidence to women around the world. With this competition expertise, she has been a major presence on air, co-hosting and color commentating both the Miss USA and Miss Universe pageants for the last few years. She's been featured on Keeping Up with the Kardashians, the MTV reality series Made, and she was invited as a model coach for Toyota's worldwide Get Going Challenge. She says her main objective is to share her message of self-confidence and style to her many followers and other women around the world. The one and only... Lou Sierra, welcome to the podcast. So great to have you on. Tim, I'm taking you everywhere <laughs> with me for you to do that. I know, I, I know. Mean, you're I welcome. I you were professional, but you're awesome. Thank well, you. Yeah, where do you want to go next? Where's Miss Universe? <laughs> um, they have not told us. I'm not even sure they know. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to Miss Universe, very often countries will say maybe or yes. And then, you know, when it comes to the logistics, the finances, the you know, the all meat and potatoes, they have to second guess it. So I'm not sure yet. I do not know. And I'm very excited and looking forward to it. Well, I'll see you there wherever we end up going. Yay. All right. So, hey, I I do want to know this because I've actually never asked you this. We've talked a few times. You um, have been the featured runway coach for Miss USA and Miss Universe since 2006. At what point did you actually get connected with the pageant world? At that point. I never even thought of doing anything pertaining to pageants, and I I don't mind confessing, my supermodel girlfriend still can't believe this is what I do, (laughs) um, because I I don't mind saying this. I don't think it's a big secret. Pageant girls want to be models. Models do not want to win pageants. Really? So, no, not at all. So, tell me about... Not at all. Well, well, tell me about... So, I know you were were basically a supermodel. You know, you were were modeling with the the big girls up there uh, for a long time, and you you were kind of known as the diva. Naomi Campbell. Exactly. Paris, Italy, Germany. Yes, sir. And, And you were the one to look out for up there, not them. And that was the interesting... I've watched some old videos and just kind of the explanations on some of the shows that covered you. I mean, you were the one to look out for. What was it about modeling that you just that drew you to it and, and made you so good at it? Well, quite frankly, I always wanted to be an actress. Television, movies, that was my heart. Unfortunately, my height became a very big issue. I had a very famous um, director when I was auditioning for Josephine Baker, The Life Story, up against Lynn Winfield. And he sat me down and said, I need you to understand I could never hire you. For me to hire you and you wear heels at 6364, everyone in the background, and you know what background is, everyone in the little cafe walking down the street, all the men would have to be 6'6 to 6'7 to make you look feminine. So it it broke my heart, and I remember continuously I'm still trying to beat that. I can be the only tall 
six foot tall African American actress. Um, and finally, when someone said you should use that to your advantage, modeling that would be to your advantage, I became known as the girl on the runway that will do things other models wouldn't because I always thought of as an as acting. I always put a character in the outfit and said, what would she do? So Bob Mackey asking me to portray Billie Holiday or Patrick Kelly asking me to burst out of a banana and be Josephine Baker. <laughs> Those things were natural to me because I was an actress before I was a model. Well, you've walked for tons of huge brands. Um, you mentioned Bob Mackie. I was watching a video this morning in which he was interviewed, and he was talking about you specifically. Uh, so let me read yeah. a quote that he gave in one of his interviews. He says, Lucy Era is one of my stars, and she loves an audience, and they love her, and she just knows what to do. The girl should be on Broadway is what she really should be. Would you agree with his assessment? Oh. <laughs> Bob, um, it was so fortunate. Bob Mackey made me the um, opening cover of his huge coffee table book. Anyone buying his book, uh, which is his story, Share is in it. Of course, Carol Burnett. I am the inside cover of, of that book. I was known as the Bob Mackey model for many years, yes. Well, when people think of uh, runway model divas, um, they think of, you know, the Naomi Campbells and the Tyra Banks, but... Uh, from what I understand, on the inside world in supermodeling, you were that girl that they all said, you know, she's basically the best one walking the runway. When you hit the runway, when you feel the energy of the crowd around you and you're obviously modeling these outfits for the designers, uh, what, what's going through your head? Because I've seen you train the girls. I know what you tell them, but what's going through your head when you're supermodeling? Well, that's the biggest difference between modeling and pageantry. Pageant girls sell themselves. They have to make themselves stand out. We don't do that in fashion shows. We sell the outfit. Now, I, I don't mind saying in the 90s, there was more twirling. There was more energy than there is now. Mm -hmm. But we always said, this outfit has a pocket. Let me show the pocket. This outfit has a full skirt. Let me spin so you see the fullness of the skirt. This outfit has a sleeve. Let me hold my arm out. A model sells an outfit. And, and, and let me just say this. There, there was a time where there were just runway models and just editorial models. The worlds didn't cross. And then one day an agent said, hmm, those runway girls are doing Germany, Italy, Paris, Tokyo, New York twice a year. And in between going to the island of Capri with Paco Rabanne, going to Russia with Givenchy, they're working all the time in editorial girls, magazine girls. No magazine is going to hire the same girl within a year to be on the cover. Catalogs might use the same girl, but catalog doesn't make a girl famous. So the agent called the designer and said, if you use one of my editorial girls in your show, she photographs incredibly and any picture taken of her on the runway, you can use for publicity. Hmm. that's when the supermodel was born. And that's a Naomi Campbell or a Tara Banks. They did more editorial than I did when they started. I had just started as well, but I was established as a top runway girl selling clothing. I survived because I photographed well, as all, um, I photographed well also. Many of my counterparts that were walking divas did not photograph that well. But I did. And that's how I maintained and survived the next era. Because Naomi and Tara was that supermodel photography and runway. So that's, that's how that was born. Well, look, you worked in the era of what you, know, what you mentioned when the supermodel was born, and they were a really big deal. So we'll take you know, Naomi Campbell, Christy Turlington, Cindy Crawford, yes, Linda, Linda, Evangelista. Linda Evangelista. Who I, Was mm -hmm. she the one that said, I won't Claudia get out of bed Schaefer. for less than 10 grand? Is that her? Yes, yes. <laughs> what was it like to work in that time when supermodels were basically A-list stars? I, I got to tell you, I I don't know any other time, so I don't have anything to compare it to. Nowadays, I'm not doing nearly as much modeling because I'm busy. Matter of fact, my, my agent and I are having a serious dilemma. I, I think I'm going to be forced to leave because I'm already booked two months in advance with girls that I work with. I allow them to book early so they can buy a ticket, mm -hmm. um, an inexpensive airline ticket. So I'm of no use to an agent that wants to send me out, but I'm already booked. 
three weeks from now with a client. So that era was great. Were there more shows? Yes, yes. There was more money in the United States for fashion. uh, Were the girls able to show off so you knew more about us? Yes. Now New York Fashion Week is walking just straight, snaking back. There, if you do one turn, it might be at the end. If you do one pose, very often they don't even want that. What's really scary is designers are moving to hologram. Hologram. Oh, hi. Okay, there we go. Now they're moving to holograms on the runway and top digital models in print. One of the biggest print models right now is not a human being. She's a digital model. <laughs> scary, isn't and it? She just landed a hundred thousand dollar cosmetic campaign. So her own, the, her, the person who invented her, which is a German photographer, just got paid that. So photographers can now invent 3D digital holograms and get paid as the model. Well, digital models, it looks like a person. The hologram, all I see is the clothing standing on its own with nobody in it. But Did in they make showrooms, one of you? No, but, okay, in showrooms, they are going to make a human that's a digital Right now, the designers are putting their clothing in digital form, and it's only the clothing standing still on a runway, and the clients are walking around the clothing. There's no model in the clothing. The clothing is freestanding just there. Totally fascinating. Wow, wow. And if you look up Balmain, Balmain reveals their first lineup of virtual models for their campaign. The whole campaign is virtual models. They're not real. I'm going to have to look that up just so I can experience yes. it. Yes, Balmain that's, that's totally reveals the lineup of their virtual models for their latest campaign. So going back to, to your specific career, um, y- yes. you had that time of the supermodel uh, before things started to evolve. 2006 comes along, you get involved in the pageants. Did you feel like you were able to bring something different to the pageant world to really open it up and, and make it more maybe fashion centric? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would just say what I did was I could teach a girl how to stand out in a room full of beautiful women without being obnoxious. Because very often girls want to stand out and they're doing it incorrectly because you can stand out in the wrong way. But because I did it on a daily basis and not one time a day, in Paris, I went three to eight castings a day. New York, an average of two to four castings a day. I had to learn how to stand out without screaming, without, you know, just being obnoxious with a room full of beautiful women all day and do it on a daily basis for a living and get up the next day and feel good about myself. That is really a big part of pageantry. If girls say to themselves, what is the job? Because that's what I find most girls get confused. They believe the job winning a pageant is for me to model. Not at all. Matter of fact, I can't name a Miss USA that has ever done Donna Karen or Bill Blass or Oscar de la Renta. Doing Sherry Hill is working for a sponsor, but you don't model. Well, what is her job, Lou, to be good for branding and represent the organization? What does that mean? What are the physicals of that? She's going to go behalf of the organization and speak to young girls and lift their self-esteem. She's going to bring platforms out to the front, open up conversations, but very important, She's going to show parents, you want your daughter to hang with me or be me or be a part of this organization. So if you can't speak, if you can't stand before a crowd and command their attention, you can't have this job. It has nothing to do with spinning the most or the tightest buttocks or the six pack where I can see ribs. It has nothing to do with any of that. Well, you're right in the middle of it. And, and so I got to ask you this because I've had, you know, over 50 people on this podcast now. I talk to state title holders all the time, as do you. And even when I'm up on stage reading their bios, one of the biggest things, as you just mentioned, that they all hope to and aspire to be is a model. And a lot of them right now, kind of the, the hero of the modern day pageant world, I would say, is Olivia Copa, who you have worked with. Yes. 
Um, yeah. Because she has a big Instagram following. She is quote unquote modeling in some ways. And that's what they look at as the epitome of what this could possibly do for me. As you look at it and you work with every single one of these girls before they step on the stage, what do you see as the epitome of what a national or world title holder can be? Well, let me just say Olivia is not trying to do runway. Olivia is doing more speaking. She's been on Entertainment Tonight as a host. And because speaking is what she did to win USA and Universe, that was a natural crossover. So speaking is always an option. Anything to do with hosting, anything of that nature. But to, do, to be a high fashion model, you have to be over the height of five foot nine. Do you know why, Tim? Uh, I actually don't. I'd love to hear it. The clothing isn't made once they find the model they like. Each designer has a pattern model. She's called a fit model. She's their ideal size. And designers want their clothing shown. So they want the longest arm possible to show the sleeve on that blouse. They want the longest legs possible to show all the pattern work. That's why. It's not about me finding somebody who can spin. It's about a designer selling their clothing. That's number one. I want you to see more of the detail work on the outfit, too. When a, when a group of clothing finishes at New York Fashion Week, that group of clothing, all of that, goes in what's called a trunk show. Oscar de la Renta takes his clothing to Texas, Neiman Marcus. And the wealthy women come and they order those clothing before they come to the store. Just like a girl in the pageant world does a Sherry Hill trunk show Mm -hmm. and she can come and order the dress. Yes. Well, that's what designers do. So if a designer used 30 models and one was 5'6", one was 5'7", one was 5'8", one was 5'9", two were 5'2", one was 4'11", each each state they go to, they would have to find a model to fit those particular outfits. That's ludicrous. So agents and designers got together and said, agents said, tell us what you want in every state so we make sure we have it. Designers said, I want a certain height so people can see the workmanship in my clothing. And the designers have a fit model so they start to make their patterns the day after one fashion week is over. They don't wait till they find a model and then say, let me make something for her. That outfit then has to be sold in the showroom. So it has to be a sample size and it has to travel. That's why for high fashion, you have to be 5'9". Now, there is another side of modeling. It's called commercial print. And what that really means is beautiful girl next door. That's the girl you see in Gap, Banana Republic. They're not six feet tall. Those, those, because that clothing isn't geared for six feet tall women. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, I can't buy anything out of Gap. No, there are a lot of designers, a lot of American designers. I can't. They don't cut that way. They cut more American size. The waist is a little bigger. The torso is shorter. Nothing to do. The, The torso doesn't fit mine. So that's called commercial print. Now, if you try to stay in your lane, you can work. It's girls who are 5'4", trying to be high fashion with the pictures they're taking. Instead of taking a beautiful Avon shot, Avon will hire commercial print and pay the same money that a MAC cosmetic who might hire a six feet tall girl. So you have to know your market and you can make a living. Well, yeah, because I mean, look, people like you don't come along every day where you're six feet tall and, and walk in high fashion runway. Is that why um, a, a girl you will recognize her name, Sophie Rovenstein, last year, Tennessee teen, uh, got into the Victoria's Secret uh, show this year? Yeah, Victoria's Secret, it's not a height. Victoria's Secret, it's an editorial. Each of their girls are strong editorial girls. They don't have to have ever walked in another show before. They don't have to have done a Donna Karen or Oscar de la Renta because you're not really selling the clothing. You get what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's lingerie. They want strong editorial cover girl. That's the thing with Victoria's Secret. You have to be very strong editorial wise to be in their show. Not all their girls are tall. They have girls coming from Brazil that are five, six. Um, Victoria's Secret is not considered a high fashion show. What would you call it? It's a top fashion show, but it's not considered high fashion in the clothing world 
because it's not clothing. Ah, okay. Makes sense. Yes. So hey, let, let me ask you this because I know a lot of the girls mm-hmm. listening, uh, they, they want to go into modeling and they're thinking about a okay. modeling career. And so you are somebody who's on the inside, obviously knows this business back and forth. So here's what I want to ask you that you can maybe to explain yes. to them is, okay, I'm getting into pageants. I'm thinking about, you know, I want to win a pageant. I would love to be a model someday. Where do I start? And I guess probably more than anything, what are my chances? I think that's what most of them okay, are trying so to think I about. I only know how to be honest, Tim. Okay, the good. That's what I want. The first thing I would tell her to do is to never say she was in a pageant. Kind of like acting. Yes. And again, pageant girls sell themselves. Models sell products. And, and they're afraid. If you're beautiful, you're beautiful. You don't have to say you did a pageant to, to get a modeling agency. A modeling agency isn't going to take you because you did or didn't do one. I'm saying it's not necessary. Anything that's not necessary, don't do. Do you think now, the perception oh, of mm-hmm. pageants and modeling came from people like Shana Mochler, who ended up you know, getting some, some big ads in, in a lot of magazines? Uh, I guess that was the late 90s that she ended up getting those. But is that where that perception came from, that pageants lead to modeling? Yes, but even before that, there were many Miss Americas. Beauty pageant did the, the women who won the beauty pageant did all the TV commercials. They did the soapbox, the dish detergent. They were all the pretty girls who did those things. And I'm not saying, and let me be clear, pageantry is great. And commercial print is different than doing high fashion. I'm saying it would be very hard for me to name a girl who won a pageant that did Donna Karen's fashion show. So basically... I'm not saying she can't do commercial print. She could have the cover of a magazine because they're beautiful. Again, you got to know your market. And, you know, when I talk to a lot of them today, um, you know, one of the big names I always hear come up when I say, what would you love to do? Uh, Victoria's Secret Pink, you know, kind of the, the more the, the teenage, you know, younger 20s brand comes out. Yeah, they I, would just love ne- to be part I of tell that girls one. to never, ever, ever say they want to do an underwear show. Why? A top model would never name a show she wants to do. If she wants to be a model, she wants to be a top model, and a top model does. Um, Victoria's Secret, Pink, Victoria's Secret, regular, um, um, a MAC cosmetic campaign, the cover of Vogue. A top model would never say, I want to do one job because she can't survive off that. See, modeling is a living. It's not a hobby. So a so, model would never say, I want to do one thing because she knew she can't make a living off doing one thing. So here's the question I have and the other perception that I, I, I frankly have no idea. I'd love to hear it from you is, you know, if you get into high fashion and you're doing those runway shows, um, of course, the outside perception that, it, you know, it's just gotten a stain over the years is that they diet you down so frail that you hard, hardly get to eat. Now, I don't believe that's always the case. And certainly you're somebody who's been on the inside who can speak to it. So tell me, there's obviously a look that you have to maintain in order to be on a stage or a runway. Tim, How much you is and involved? I both know that there are naturally thin people. Oh, yeah. Not everybody is starving. I can honestly say I don't starve. I eat so much. And even at Universe, I lose so much weight that I'll have people going, Lou, since you've been here, you may have dropped like three pounds. Because <laughs> like, you have a right. naturally I high eat, metabolism. And I eat healthy. I don't drink one calorie, Tim. I don't drink, I don't drink a can of juice. I don't drink a soda. I drink water. So I, I eat very clean and healthy. So when you add long days and stress, I'm going to lose weight. Well, that's what modeling is. Modeling is going on five castings that are not in the same area. The shows are in the same area. The castings are all over Paris and Italy. And you're trying to get there on time and stand out. And when you get um, rejected, and rejected just means they don't use you, you get up the next day and you got to have the same energy. It, the, the two have nothing to do with each other. Nothing. Matter of fact, there are some top models that if you saw them without makeup, you'd be like, get out of here. <laughs> but it's because they sell a product. That's why they could sell their behind off. If you put a phone in their hand, they could sell that phone like you wouldn't believe. The way they would lean on it, the dreaminess in their eyes, the delicacy they hold the phone. That's why I get pageant girls who are confused. They're very pretty. But if I tell them to sell this phone, they go, well, what do you mean? Hold it. Tim, you're going to tell me 
there aren't pageant girls who want to go into acting. You got to be able to act to go into acting. Well, modeling, you have to be able to sell a product. Well, look, I've heard you in interviews talk about that, you know, where when you were on the runway, high fashion runway, it was basically acting. You know, you were in you, you. I even see you talk about it with the girls at the national competitions when you've got them in the expo center and you guys are out on the floor and you're talking about how you're supposed to use your body language, your facial expressions, the types of or faces that you're supposed to offer the audience. In your eye. You have to think something. And that's what comes across to the person looking at you. That's one of the things. I think is very important to win pageantry. If you go out there thinking, oh my God, I hate my thighs. I hate this dress. Why did I cut my hair like this? Why is that girl in front of me? Oh my God, she must be six foot six in those shoes. Oh my God, my thighs are rubbing together. Oh my God, hope I win. (laughs) And the girl after you is thinking, I rocked an interview. My hair, my makeup, my skin, my wardrobe, it doesn't get any better than this. And judges, let's get something straight. These other girls have one job. That's to give me time to change clothes. (laughs) I'm your winner. If you're not thinking that, you can't get mad at the girl who is. That's why you have to love yourself. Tim, in in the modeling industry, do you know there was a week, and I'm not exaggerating, I went on anywhere from 18 to 25 castings. It was a big, heavy week. And I didn't land one job. I didn't land one of those jobs. No, but for each of those designers, they were right. One designer said I was too tall. I was for his clothing. One designer said I was too short. I was for his clothing. At the end of the day and or the week, if you can't still be secure with who you are, you start to self-medicate or lose your identity, which I think go hand in hand. Because you're looking for moments where you can say, I'm just not going to worry about this. Mm -hmm. Let me put this all in a package for you so you can kind of help people understand this. So one of the big reasons that this very podcast exists is because after they go out to Miss USA with you or Miss America or wherever, they finish up, they don't win. Huge disappointment sets in. I thought this was going to be my ticket and a depression sets in. And they really have trouble making the transition from, okay, yes, that, they that do. was my dream. Especially going, staying back home. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I basically what I want you to do is there are a lot of them that are saying, I want to be a model. You know, they're working with maybe local metropolitan agencies or photographers who have told them, you know, you, you could definitely do well in this business. I want you to give them the reality of what pursuing this career looks like, because I don't think a lot okay. of them understand that. And I don't I'm you not saying it. this to be mean to them. I just want them to know no. for real. This is what it is. They don't know what they don't know. That is not mean. And I think it's awesome that you are trying to do this. Because modeling for a lot of these women become a very expensive hobby. Mm -hmm. One, you can't buy a portfolio. A portfolio is a book full of work, not pictures you paid for. So a top agent would sign you, send you to a photographer such as a Fidel here in New York. You would get two to three shots, then you compete against me. There (laughs) is no paying for 40 and 50 pictures because... The agency knows the clients want to see work, not pictures you paid for. Two, to make a living, you have to be in an area where models make a living. I'm nothing against Columbus, Georgia. But you're not going to make a living modeling in Columbus, Georgia. It's pretty much New York or L.A. at this point. Maybe Chicago. New York, L.A., you can make a living in Atlanta. Um, Miami has gotten flooded. If you do television... You can do Miami, especially if you're bilingual. But Miami has gotten flooded because the the biggest designers in Miami Fashion Week, other than swimwear, is Latin designers, and they like curvier girls who are smaller. But because there are so many, they want you the entire day, and they pay you $150. You can't make a living off that, doing that twice a year. Not at all. So first, you have to know know your market. And two, you have to be willing to move there. That's why models, and you know this, Tim, models and actresses in New York and L.A., they're bartenders at night. They work in the theater at night, um, sitting people if they have to. They're waitresses, so they can have their days free to go on casting. Because even if you get an agent, which is 
so difficult to get a good agent. Even if you get an agent, you then have to get a job. The agent can't get you the work. They only send you on the casting. Now, to get an agent. To get an agent is as simple as Googling either high fashion, if I'm five foot nine, or commercial print agent, if I'm not, looking at the girls on their agency page. Are the pictures paid for pictures or are they tear sheets from a magazine? That means those girls are working. Send your picture in. Any agent will, will bite if they need your look. Girls think if I'm pretty, the agent will take me. No. An agency doesn't need 40 blondes with blue eyes. So they have to need your look. So send in a picture with a skinny jean and a tank top. No makeup again. No makeup. And quite frankly, if you can't go without makeup and look good and feel good, you can't be a model. Models do not go in casting space full of makeup. They don't. You don't even go into the agency. If you do and the agent likes you, and boy, they got to really like you. They'll tell you to go in the bathroom and wash your face and come back out. Most of the time, they'll send you away because they'll be afraid you're going to go into a casting with a face full of makeup. A model goes on a casting, a blank slate, and I am whatever that employer wants me to be. That's uh-huh. that's a pretty hard pill to swallow for most. I mean, that's that's really hard for them because they've, met, they've never been treated like that or at least just that's been right, told Ken. raw, like, that's look, this right. is the deal. In their defense, we are saying, do you like this makeup? Then do the makeup you like if you like. Do you like this color dress? Then wear that in interview. Do you like your hair that way, baby? Then that's the way. But this is true. Once in Japan, Tim, Kenza Yamamoto had us come in and he said, just make sure your hair is washed. Don't blow dry it. Don't flat iron. As an African-American woman, I got thick, really kinky, curly hair. So I walk in basically with an afro I mean, not even tame. He opened up eggs, raw eggs, took the egg white, separated the egg white, stirred it up, and put it in our hair and then blow dried it and pulled our hair out like dandruff was flaking, said no makeup, and we had to walk down the runway in $10,000 evening dresses, and we better sell them like we love them. Crazy. It's not up to me what I look like, whatever their thought is. That's why you have to feel great with no makeup. On the set, you can't open your mouth up and say, do you mind if I have makeup or I don't like this? Never, ever would a model do that. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, thank I'm you for sorry, sharing so much. No, girls look, have done it. I get it. And I appreciate you sharing all that about the modeling world because I think it's very important and, and girls need to hear this. Uh, whether you want to hear it and whether you're hearing this and you're totally disappointed, it's necessary because... You, we're saving you a ton of time moving forward that you might waste, you know, and end up going, wait a minute, and this, money. this and is money the pinnacle? And money people saying, let me train you. You don't have to be trained. I'm telling you, if an agent wants you, they have somebody at their agency that will do a little basic boot camp for you. And they know what's modern right now. They know what their clients want. And it won't cost you anything. Oh, big red lights. If it costs you something to join the agency, it's not an agency you should join. Get (laughs) out. Now, let me just say, well, you shouldn't have signed anything. Let me just say, a major agency might say, we have to send you on two photo shoots. We're going to pay for one. You have to put up the money for the other. But the money is going to come out of the first money you make. Agencies take 20% of your money and they charge the client 20% on top. So that's how agencies make their money. Now, I will also say major agencies right now are taking $100. It's average to take $100 a month for online handling. There used to be a time, Tim, where clients would send my portfolio. Avon wanted to see a black girl. Um, All the agents in all of New York would send portfolios of their top black girls to Avon. That that person... um, the delivery person used to get paid that, you know, there were services like that. Mm-hmm. So we had to pay for a, a set fee because our portfolio was going all the time. Now it's a handling fee on online that when an agency says, Avon, again, I want a beautiful black girl. My booker at my agency sends my portfolio electronically. And Avon from there looks at all of those. 
with that maintaining of the website, updating my pictures, the color, if the, if the code changes, all of that costs me $100 a month handling fee. Which is not the end of the world. No, I mean, that's, that's oh my gosh, that's great. Are you kidding? Yeah, in fine. Italy, in Italy, it was $1,000 a month to be put in the, what they called the big portfolio. It was mm -hmm. a huge book in a room where clients would go in and while they're talking to bookers, they can look through this book. And every girl had one page on the book where like five pictures could fit, five, eight by 10. And it would cost you $1,000 a month during fashion week to be put in that book. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, good, good, good information for everybody to know. So oh, one other sharing. thing. Yeah. One other thing. When you work in overseas, agents take 50%, 20 Oof. for them and 30 for the government. You can't go in foreign countries and not pay taxes and work. <laughs> you can't make money on that. I mean, 50%, man, that's a, that's a killer. Yeah, and you pay your own airfare and hotel. Yeah, so pretty they much you're making that. about 10% when it's all said and done. You may not land a job. This is during Paris, Italy Fashion Week. Hmm. Man, that's crazy. So that's how you go. And let me add, you have to go three weeks before the Fashion Week. One week to go on castings and make sure your portfolio is right. And every country you go to is going to want to make a different composite. My composite in Paris was very different than my composite in Italy and in New York. Because the agent knows what's going to draw the attention of those those countrymen, their fellow countrymen, those designers, what they're looking for. Okay? So I go three weeks in advance to make castings, make sure I got a composite. That second week I'm there, I'm going on more castings, and by then I'm being put on hold. The third week I'm there, I'm doing fitting. They pull me in, and the pattern size is made, but they'll roll in a cup for a cuff. If it's too long, they'll let out a seam. If it's too high in my crotch, they'll put a shoe with it, you know, and then the fourth week we do the shows. So that entire time beforehand, I'm paying my hotel. An agency doesn't do that. They don't know if you're going to work. Well, ladies, I hope you're taking notes. Really good stuff here, Lou. Thank you. That's why you have to be a businesswoman. That comes in handy in winning a pageant. You can't win a pageant and get up late every morning while you're at USA because Miss USA takes airplanes. You can't get up and say, what should I wear? Or does this go with this? You can't ask a question and talk like this when you ask the question. <laughs> so the person you're asking has to repeat to the crowd. Again, we need a boss lady. Well, She's let's let's organized. talk about pageants. You're you're basically one of the very few people that I could have on here who, you know, who's going to talk with me real and raw about the pageant industry. And there's one thing that I want to address because I think it needs to be addressed. I, I hear it all the time. It just gets so old hearing about it. And that is a, a pageant's fixed or the judging panel was told who to pick or, or this or that. And it's just it gets old after a while. You see it on Instagram it really constantly. Does, and really, you and I really both does. know we're behind the scenes. We see it. We know what goes on. Yes. It has yes. nothing to do with fixing or politics no. or, or no. you know, this company wants this girl, so we chose her. It, it Literally, what you talked about earlier is everything. It's who this girl is when she walks through the door, no matter what she looks like, no matter how tall she is, no matter what she's wearing. It's all in her head. And how she conducts herself from the first day to the last day. It is a job interview. Let me just say, what organization gets paid more, and by that, um, um, more girls enter if a certain girl wins? It's, it's ridiculous. If a redhead wins, we don't get more girls next year. We don't. If an African-American girl wins, we don't get more girls next year. She has to do the job. Notice that the winners do the job well. Can you please notice that? Let, let's, let's, it'd be different if we said, the winner not even good. You know they, that was fixed. The winners are great. They're doing the job. So it's not good for branding if a certain girl wins. If a certain colored or Caucasian girl wins three or four years in a row. You wouldn't believe, Tim, the conversation I got when Team USA one year, and I can't remember what year, the top five were all blonde. Oh, it was the year in, at the Venetian in Vegas, the year Catherine Hyde oh, okay. gave up her I crown. Yeah, I, I was I there for that the one. Teen pageant. Yeah. yeah, but mothers called me and said, are you going to tell me? And you know what my response was? 
Were you there in the interview when they chose the top 15? Well, no. So are you going to tell me it was fixed? All I can say is, it. well, we got it now. I have people saying it has to be fixed. And, and you know what's really ironic? They're saying it's fixed because Teen USA, USA, and Miss America. As if Miss America and Miss USA got together and agreed on anything. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, the the whole CBS morning show about it's all being black girls. Yeah, I, I... So they called each other and said, hey, 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 how, how about we do this? Let's <laughs> all do the same. Yeah. As if Miss America and Miss USA got together. And that just makes me crack up laughing when people say that. I say, you right. know they would have had to conspire together. Oh, yeah. And you think they did that. Realistically, you think those two organizations got together and agreed to make a minority the yeah, winner. They don't you, talk. That's what you, they don't talk. Thank you, Tim. Thank <laughs> well, here's you. the funny thing is that it's, it's always how it's portrayed after the fact that makes it look like, oh, it could have been possibly rigged. So let's take the, you know, the top five blondes in, in Vegas that year in 2016 in the teen show that uh, – I believe Carly Hay won. And then this year, now it's, well, both girls, you know, in the USA system had afros. So they must, you must have had to have an afro to win. I mean, come on. Are you serious? I was, sta- I stood it's, on it's stage so and watched re- Kaylee Garris in my strange. face answer the question. She won. She got it. She did it. Yeah, but you always hear that. But eight strangers, the director found eight complete strangers that agree on everything or the whole tabulation isn't true. And they put in the person they want. That's the only eight strangers agree. But I got to say, Tim, um, I'm never allowed to say any of my winners that win any pageant in the entire world. Sure. And I have so many girls that win world that win. Oh, my gosh. High School America. IJM. I have outstanding teen. And I accidentally because I went to my first teen USA pageant. It was a knee jerk reaction stated that I worked with the winner and the oh, backlash you for that. of people wanting to assume. And, and for the record, let me say, I have two teen, other teen USAs that won. Cammy Crawford was my first team that ever won, but the pageant wasn't fixed then because nobody knew I worked. Mm-hmm. I have nothing to do with the teen pageant, nothing. I'm not there at rehearsals. I'm not there, but I train a lot of girls. So isn't the odds of one of my girls winning going to be slightly something that might happen in the realm of reality? Very good. (laughs) So why is it fixed if my girl wins and I trained her? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And let me just say one other thing. As a devout Christian, I'm telling you, I would never work for an organization that I thought was fixing anything. Good for you. It's very simple for me. I would not. My integrity and the girls who work with me know that. I promise girls I will never tell anything they do or say to me. That's why they know I'm their ride or die partner. They're, they're just things I won't do. I want to be the person I needed when I started to make my dreams come true. I needed someone that knew what they were talking about, that wouldn't fleece me, and would never throw me under the bus. And that's the person I want to be. Well, I want to I want to talk about um, the way a lot of people know you by obviously watching Miss USA or Miss Universe. They see you work with the girls and they do the videos during every pageant and they see, you know, kind of what they go through. And um, I'm going to ask you a question. I already know the answer to it, but I certainly want you to explain it to everybody listening. Um, There is what I call during every pageant uh, Miss USA, Miss Universe, the Lou moment of truth, we'll call it, uh, where your intensity comes out and you put some fear in the girls competing. I know the answer, but I want you to tell people why it is important that you do that. Well, let me just start with when I question girls afterward, because I want to be the best person I can be. And I ask young ladies, what could I have done differently? You know what they say? You joke with us so much and make us laugh. It, it was almost too late. And we wish you were harder on it. That sounds strange, but I got that more than I got anything. And girls get there and get to a point where they don't realize in three days, none of you can't rehearse anymore. You can't. I need you to be dead serious because there will only be one winner. This is not the place to come and interview for your new best friend, 
your maid of honor, or your first baby's godmother. This is not that place to come and look for her. This is a job interview. We're looking for a boss lady. And by no means am I saying you won't make friends. I need you to be social. But I need you to be serious. Because once this is over, you are going to regret the times you were giggling and doing the joke of the day instead of reviewing your notes. And I would guess just venturing, because uh, I watch the videos, I, I see it, and I, I have a very good feeling, and you know this firsthand, that a lot of the girls that when you get serious and you, and you get firm with them, I think there are quite a few that have never had a Luciera do that to them, and they don't know how to handle it. Um, no, they don't, and I don't mind saying there are some of them that don't like it. But you should know something, Tim. I think one of the funniest things is when I see a girl and she, I, I made a suggestion, and she either, she didn't do it. Now, she didn't do it twice. After twice, I pull her to the side and I say, baby, now I need you to listen carefully. Are you going to keep doing that? Mm. No, you know you can, and I'm going to high five you and I'm going to love you. Really? Yes. If I want you to be a self-sufficient, independent woman, why would I get mad if you don't listen to me? I want you to do you. I'm only here to give you advice. But I just will say, just be prepared if it doesn't work to live with the consequences and don't blame it on someone. Now, I'm going to stop suggesting you do what I've suggested because, one, you don't want to, or, two, you can't do it. You can't stop doing what I'm telling you to stop, or you can't do what I need you to do. So I'm going to stop yelling at you. And I do that. Wait, wait, wait. I know we're, we're cutting short on time here real quick. I got one more question, yeah. then we'll do our uh, 10 questions. Uh, last one is, there is a saying that you use, you use it all the time, and it is, there are only two kind of people in the world, those who want to be me and those who want to marry me. Where does that come from and why do you use it? That came around when girls ask me to look, when, when they're looking into the camera, what should they be thinking? And I said, I can't tell you what to think. What that power is behind your eyes is strictly yours. What I'm thinking is, there are only two people in the world, those who want to be me and those who want to marry me. Which one are you? <laughs> so that's what I'm thinking. All right. So um, I want to get into our rapid fire, get to know you questions, because I know you got to run. So we'll so? do 10 questions real quick, like a game show. So make it positive and fun. You ready for it? Ready. All right, here we go. Number one, of all the pageant queens you've worked with, who do you think has had the best walk, in your opinion? Oh, my gosh. There is no best walk. The best walk you never saw was last year, Jamaica, who froze. Her walk was incredible. But I've had several girls the year before that. Holland, which you never saw. She didn't make the top 15. There were some girls I honestly would, I told them, if we were on a runway, I'd trip them. Because that's how good they were. <laughs> All right, number two. Most important thing required for any woman to walk the runway. Confidence. She can never walk without confidence. Number three, how many different hairstyles does Luciera wear in a week? Oh, baby. <laughs> well, you don't. Let me count my wigs. One, two, then the dreadlocks, and then I'm going to say an average four. But just for the record, that's how you keep your boyfriend. Keep going. <laughs> Number four, are you really as tough on the girls as you appear to be? No. And it's so funny because when the girls watch it, they say, Lou, they show the 30 seconds of you in a whole week where you might have been hard on us. They don't show you high-fiving us, laughing. I make them laugh so much. I do funny dances. I imitate. No, no, I am not. <laughs> All right, number five. What is your favorite part of watching a pageant? Um, I just saw my first no, that's not true. I just saw my second pageant, and it would definitely be on-stage questions. I love on-stage questions. The pressure of it? Yes. Yes. Love it. Number six, what do you do during the year when you're not preparing and coaching pageant girls if you have extra time? Well, work-wise, I choreograph um, fashion shows and other big projects like Samsung and things of that nature. But I'm also a life coach. I just went to two shelters last week. I travel to school and speak to their, their seniors on my seminar called Having a Plan. I really inspire others. 
Number seven, you've got 13 Miss USA pageants under your belt. What was your most memorable Miss USA moment? When Olivia in Maryland, and I don't remember her name, I asked her to please forgive me. She ended up becoming my first runner up. When they were holding hands, because both of them were my girls, and Olivia won, and Marilyn came off the stage and looked at me and said, Lou, I never thought I'd say this, but I need you to make her Miss Universe. And I knew what she meant, because the minute I helped Olivia become Universe, Marilyn moved up to first runner-up. I love it. That's, that's very cool. All right, number eight. Who inspired you to get into runway modeling? Wow. I had an Aunt Brenda who really pushed me um, and helped me. She was the diva of the aunt. I had an Aunt Alice who was very passionate about anything and just said, find your hobby. And it was dance and theater and poetry and modeling. And my uncle Elisha was my business person. That was the person that made me, uh, everything was business in Paris. I knew when the transfer, when they exchanged francs to Deutschmark. I mean, now they have Euro, but so there were a lot of people, a lot of people that have helped me. My mother, of course, said she'd help me make any dream come true, and she did. Oh, that's very cool. Number nine, what's the most expensive dress that you have ever worn on a stage or runway? That I paid for or that I've ever worn? That, no, that you just wore. Period. Oh, my gosh. I've worn dresses over $30,000. Oh, easy. But you should also know I have modeled a diamond bikini in Germany. Not here, but in Germany. I did do a diamond bikini. And I don't know how much that was worth. Oh, I bet it was that very was like quarter million by bucks way. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The bottom was very uncomfortable. Use your I imagination. Bet it was. <laughs> yeah. All right, last one. Number 10. Most exciting gig that you have ever worked? Oh, my God. I know. I'm making That's- you think. Um, I've worked so many, it would honestly be hard. It would be hard to tell you, but it might be coming up soon. I have been asked, and I have not accepted yet, but I have been asked to portray one of the Josephine Bakers. Um, They're doing the biggest lifetime exhibit of Josephine Baker in New York. And I might be portraying one of her during that. Absolutely. So I'm considering it. Yeah, well, very good. Well, hey, Lou, thank you so much for answering the 10 questions in the interview today and all the great ex- uh, experience about pageants and modeling. And just, uh, look, tons of wisdom here. I hope girls are taking notes. And thanks for your time. I know you got to get rolling. So thank you so much. Thank you. And Tim, I'm so proud of you for doing this. You found a need. You put verbs in your sentences and you're making it happen. I would just tell girls, find your passion. And under fashion, passion, that umbrella is very big. Hair, makeup, photography, styling. You don't have to model. All of that is a career and not an expensive hobby. And thank you very much, Tim. You bet. And I'll see you at Miss Universe. Yay. Thank you, babe. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode and to Lou Sierra for her time. If you'd like to follow Lou on social media, you could do so on Instagram at Lucelania Sierra or go to her company website, alupinternational.com. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you wouldn't mind, please subscribe. You can do so on Spotify, iTunes, the podcast app, Google Play, and YouTube. Or you can just go to lifeafterthecrown.com. And for weekly podcast updates, just follow me on Instagram at Tim Tialdo. Until next time, remember the words of Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Talk to you next week, everybody. Everybody.